Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hello, my name is Zandra Ellis, and I am the Senior Director of Hospice and Palliative Care Solutions at Access. I'm delighted to be with you today to discuss how to prepare for the new hospice final rule. A couple of things before we get started, a little introduction about myself. Um, currently here at Access, I work with the team that creates hospice specific software that is easy to use and that is clinically, administratively, and financially compliant. So my real passion is in quality and regulatory um, matters regarding hospice. And I had the opportunity to serve the hospice community for many years um, at the state, regional, and local level in Texas. So whether that was working on quality improvement, maybe it was working on growth, or financial management or regulatory and compliance. I really enjoyed the time that I spent working um, in hospice organizations and with such tremendous hospice professionals. So, you know, it's been the joy of my life to bring all of those experiences to access to um, really create software that is meaningful for our hospice users and clients. So, while I um, get this set up here, please keep in mind that if you have a question, I would love for you to leave it in the chat. So when you leave that question in the chat, we will answer them um, after the webinar. We'll send a response directly to you. And I'll remind you during the um, webinar to ask those questions when they come up. So something for you guys to think about. So it seems... Um, Interesting that there are hospice regulations in the calendar year 2022 home health final rule. So if you've been in hospice for a while, you remember a few years ago that um, some very scathing reports came out about hospice care. And um, it really kind of blew up, you know, the industry. It got the attention of regulators and lawmakers and you know, everybody was OIG and CMS were all in a stir. So what they did is they attached hospice regulations in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. And what that does, is it amends the Social Security Act and it adds these provisions or hospice components, right, to the calendar year final rule for home health final rule. So that effective date is January 1st of 2022. So we're gonna keep that in mind as we kind of go through this and we talk about the why and what it means. So one of the things that the regulators really wanted to, to have in place was a process um, to really focus on their compliance, I guess their compliance with their compliance, you know, how's that going? They wanted to streamline and kind of bring everything together. You know, in the post-acute world today, we think a lot of times about how, you know, SNFs and home health and hospice and things are coming along so that we are kind of in the same, on the same path when we're taking care of Medicare beneficiaries, right? They're really trying to streamline everything. And so we all are reporting the same quality data, you know, to make things better for our, for our Medicare beneficiary patients. So what they wanted to do here is they really wanted to update the survey requirements, not only just to conclude enforcement remedies, but to kind of bring in those accrediting bodies, right? to more in line with what the state accreditation bodies, you know, we call them the state, right, in hospice. So those organizations, you know, what their requirements are. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, what that looks like as far as surveys go, what it means for the accrediting bodies, and also those, those uh, pesky little enforcement remedies that are just no fun. So when those survey requirements were updated as part of this new regulatory language, you know, the goal is to 
um, restore public trust after that report from a few years ago, address inconsistencies between survey agencies, right, and accrediting organizations, and also have accountability, right? So um, people just aren't going in and surveying organizations that maybe um, it wasn't the most fair survey. Um, I think some of us that have, have had that happen um, with no real recourse. So what this does is this does um, allow some things to be put into place that will make things more consistent for all of us. So let's talk about the surveyors first. So the first thing that we need to know about the surveyors is they're going to be undergoing comprehensive training, right? So not just a little bit of training, but a whole lot of training. So CMS is going to provide the training for state and federal surveyors. Um, and any surveyor employed by an accrediting organization, including a training and testing program approved by um, CMS no later than October 1st, 2021. And we talked about that a minute ago, right? So October 1st, 2021 has already passed. So the way it's going to work is that once this new rule goes into effect on January 1st, there's going to be about 60 days catch up time for them. So what the regulation actually says is that, you know, surveyors cannot conduct a hospice survey until they've completed the training and testing. So that should be very interesting. Another thing that I think is fascinating about this is that the training modules um, are available, some of them, to the public. So the training modules that surveyors uses, they're free for them, right? They're also free for hospice providers and the general public um, through the QSCP website. So I've included a link to that at the end of this. And so you'll get it when we send this out, but um, I, it's really fascinating and it's kind of fun to go in and see how you would do on um, a survey test. Another thing, they're updating the focus of the training, right? They really wanna, they really want the surveyors to focus on those conditions of participation, right? So the patient's rights, um, the initial and comprehensive assessment of the patient, as well as IDG uh, care planning and care coordination and quality assessment and performance improvement. So I think it's interesting that, you know, they're really bringing those back around again, and that's the focus, right? Um, those things are kind of the core um, principles of hospice, right? That patient has the right to, um, choose their care, right? Um, we've got a really strong interdisciplinary group and, you know, that's important in care planning and then always QAPI, right? We've been doing that um, for many years now, but the focus is going to be back on that. And it really makes sense with when we, we talk about in a minute about the, um, the regulations around um, enforcement for um, surveys that don't go so well. So, they really want to, um, so the plan of care is gonna be more um, important than ever. And you know, that plan of care can be a little tricky. So part of the comprehensive training is going to be um, to have the surveyors really understand how it works, right? How it all works together. So how the full interdisciplinary team is going to, should be involved. And I think that that, um, you know, interdisciplinary team, the patients, families, attending physicians, you know, they're really digging into um, those core principles of hospice. So that's one thing when we think about getting ready. I mean, the surveyors are getting ready, right? They're having this comprehensive training and they're, you know, having to dig in and they're having a test. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, we should really be paying close attention to, you um, those four core principles. So um, something for you to think about um, as you plan for 2022, you know, we can see what's over the next hill. So we just need to get ready for it. And a lot of this is um, kind of things that we take for granted. Like we do this all the time, you know, and we have this lockdown, we know what we're doing um, and we do a great job. But 
you know, I think what we're going to see next year is surveyors that come in with um, renewed vim and vigor um, and eager to show their new skills off on um, on agencies when they're doing their surveys, which should be pretty interesting. Another thing that was um, included in the uh, the final the home health final rule is um, the surveyor's conflict of interest was really. Um, they really spent some time on that, right? So they wanted to, um, so this applies to, to the state um, agencies and also the, the accreditation organization surveyors. So um, they're not allowed to survey a hospice program if the surveyor works there or has worked there in the last two years. And I think that their language is, is you know, kind of interesting. Um, it also says on this that they have can't be on the staff or a consultant to the hospice program undergoing the survey. Well, I have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, that I didn't know that this was that big of a deal. I mean, I thought that that was kind of basic, um, just business practices, right? Um, but those things have been put in line and in place to really help our surveys to be more fair. So <clears throat> you want to um, be mindful, right? Of course, you know, your red flag would go up if you had a surveyor came in that worked for you, I would hope so. Um, or a, an agency staff that you might have to use um, or even an officer of the organization. So those things are happening. So we're putting these guardrails in place to make sure that it doesn't happen. So also we talked about you can't be a compliance um, or any other agent for um, the organization. So, you know, you want to have a really clean, um, we have really clean uh, organizational charts and we know who's coming and going and, you know, how they work for us and how long they've worked for us and their other interests. So, you know, now we have guardrails in place to help identify surveyors who, you know, may have a different view of the hospice organization, whether that's fair or unfair, um, but to really level the playing field. So you also have to remember that the surveyor um, would also be considered to have a conflict of interest if they have an immediate family member who has a financial interest, interest or ownership um, interest in that hospice program, um, or they have an immediate family member that has been a patient of that hospice. So what is, a, what is an immediate family member? I mean, I think that's important for us all to know. So um, a husband or wife, a birth or adoptive parent, child or sibling, Step, step parents, children's brothers and sisters, father-in-law, mother-in-law, son-in-law, daughter-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, grandparent or grandchild, and spouse of a grandparent or grandchild. So um, that's a pretty broad um, definition of immediate family members, but I think it's important to, you know, ask the questions. And sometimes, um, you know, when you have a survey or come into your building, whether they're from an accredit accreditation organization or maybe your state authority. Um, you want, you know, I mean, I always think survey management is super important, right? So kind of seeing that surveyor as a customer, making sure that they have all their needs met, but also, you know, being efficient, right? Being prepared for the survey um, or their visit, having the things at hand that you need. Um, I think that that's important, but I also think it's important to, um, you know, talk to them a little bit, see if you, you know, if any little red flags start to go up, you know, hey, maybe I remember them from, you know, um, maybe we took care of their, you know, great grandmother three years ago, right? So um, two things to be prepared is to, you uh, have those conversations, know who your surveyors are. You can ask them if they have any conflicts of interest, right? Um, the other thing that you can do is when you are doing intake on your patients and you're caring for them during their time on hospice, kind of dig in and make sure that you get to know who their family members are, right? We should, um, 
we take care of the whole family. So we should really be talking about, you know, who are those extended family members? And that might give us some, um, some indication if we have a, a surveyor of any kind that's a family member. You know, usually you know that because somebody will come running back to the office and go, oh my gosh, you know, um, <laughs> our, you know, uh, Ms. Smith's daughter is a surveyor for, you know, CMS. She, she does surveys at the federal level, you know, and then everybody goes, oh my gosh. So um, the, the onus, while we can be prepared, right, the, and we can ask the question, the onus really is on the surveyor to disclose those interests, right? Um, those conflicts of interest, it's their responsibility. So, um, and they have to have the opportunity to recuse themselves. So I think that, um, you know, with this new requirement and with the, re the inclusion of this requirement of conflict of interest, um, in the inclusion of conflict of interest in the new surveyors training and testing, I think that things are going to be a lot better. And I think that, you know, while those things are in place, that it's important that we really think about what we need to do to um, make sure that we're ready. So we talked about that a little bit. So another interesting thing that has kind of come up is the concept of the multidisciplinary team for survey. And I've thought many, many times, you know, um, I'm not a clinician. Um, you know, I've been working with um, very, very highly skilled clinicians for over 20 years. And so a lot of times, I, you know, I say I know enough to be dangerous, right? Um, but I'm not a licensed um, clinician. So I think it's interesting, you know, we've always had nurses, nurses, nurses are registered nurses, um, have run um, surveys for a really, really long time. This new requirement, um, it includes the multidisciplinary team. I can say that three times fast. Um, does include an RN. However, um, now the requirement is, is that we may have a social worker come in, right? Or we may have a, a spiritual counselor come in, or maybe we have a physician come in or a pharmacist. So the multidisciplinary concept is alive and well. So what we're not saying is, all these people are going to be in your office for five days, right? So they're going to kind of come and go. But what we do know is that the, um, the RN will be on the survey team. Um, if there's more than one surveyor, then the additional team members must be selected from other disciplines, including an interdisciplinary group. So, you know, that means if an RN needs help, it's not going to be another RN, right? They're going to be able to call in um, other hospice professionals, credentialed professionals to help with that. So um, the way that's going to be um, tracked by CMS, because one of the things that's important to them, right, is the tracking of survey activity and outcomes, is they're going to be looking at surveys that have more than one surveyor, right? They're going to be considering um, what people they have on hand, they say their current workforce, right? But we know that they don't have a bunch of social workers or spiritual counselors or dietitians or bereavement professionals sitting around their offices. So they're going to have time. They need time to build that team or those teams. So they're going to be working on that. And, you know, they're going to give us an estimate of the time frame for, inter for in implementing that interdisciplinary team. So I'm really excited about that. And I think that, you know, when we're looking at the entire plan of care, um, the comprehensive assessment of the patient, you know, that really is on our side an interdisciplinary um, activity, right? So it only seems fair that we would have a multidisciplinary um, team come in to evaluate you know, how we're doing. And I think that it's going to shed some, some, some positive light on the care that we're giving. So let's talk a little bit about survey consistency. So this is a, this is an important one. So um, we see here that we've got CMS, that they do their monitoring, right? They look at corrective action plans and they look at corrective actions. And so what that comes up with is, is a disparity rate. So I'll explain that a little bit. So um, 
Many of us are familiar with the Form 2567, um, the CMS Statement of Deficiencies and Plan of Correction. Um, if you don't, if you aren't familiar with that, well, good for you. Um, we'll learn a little bit about it today. So um, what they do is they look at the 2567s um, and they have state operations groups, which we all know before as their regional office, right? So every state has one or two regional offices where CMS has set up camp and that's kind of their remote area away from DC where they do their work. So um, I'm still inclined to call them the regional office because survey operations groups, um, the acronym is SOG and they wrote that down. So um, I think Region, regional office is better. <laughs> so, um, so what they're doing is, is they want to make sure that when they're looking at um, state or federal surveyors, that they're also looking at those surveyors for um, the accrediting bodies, right? So JCO, CHAP, ACHC, that they're looking at those. And so the accountable organizations, the accrediting organizations, I can say that three times, um, they actually go through validation surveys conducted by the state. So I think that's really interesting. I've never heard that before. I knew it was a thing, but to see it in writing is kind of interesting for me. So validation surveys um, are also performed so they can find where the differences are, the variances are, the disparity between the state and federal surveys and the accrediting organization surveys. So um, I think that's interesting. So when they have a validation survey um, that have conditions identified by the state, but missed by the accountable organization survey team, that would be a disparity, right? And so they look at the differences between um, what the state, um, what the state report was, like what did their 2567 say for the same organization that had a survey by the accrediting organization. So that difference is called the disparity rate and it's tracked by CMS um, and a way to to inform to monitor consistency between um, state surveys and accrediting accreditation organizations um, their surveys and it's really interesting and I've included a link at the end of this um, presentation you can go online and see what that looks like. So um, what they do, what CMS does with this disparity um, rate, the, um, the surveys to validate the surveys is they wanna make sure that surveyors are thorough, accurate and consistent in their findings. So um, there won't really be any um, difference between um, your CHAP, ACHC or joint commission surveys and state surveys anymore. So that's what they're really looking at. And I think um, for me, my experience has been is that some accrediting bodies are really, really tough, right? And some of them are not as tough. And some of that has to do with, you know, the personality of your organization and the leadership of your organization and the experience of your team. So, um, you know, and everybody has different um, learning styles and different, different ways that they work and the accrediting organizations they have, you know, they follow the uh, federal guidelines, but sometimes they're laid out in a different way, presented in a different way. So I think this really kind of levels the playing field to make sure that no matter who you're being surveyed by, that you are getting a, um, a consistent survey, um, no matter who's doing it. So let's talk a little bit about 
the hotline. And I have this old phone here and that's intentional. Um, you know, when we were looking at this presentation last week, somebody said, well, that's a really old phone. It needs to be replaced. And I said, well, that's intentional. Um, you know, state um, agencies have for a long time had hotlines, right? So you could call the hotline if you had, um, if a family had a, uh, they had a complaint, right? We're required to give them the number of who to call at the state level. Um, you know, who do you call? We give them, you know, we have our requirements to call in as well, you know, and sometimes people call in and they just ask questions, right? So what the new regula regulations have is they have formalized um, the hotline requirement. So um, this is something that's been included in home health. It's going to go into effect um, December 27th. So what the hotline is going to do, um, it's going to collect and maintain and update information um, for hospice programs lo located in the United States and locality that are certified to participate in the program. So it's gonna be home health and hospice at the same time. It's going to be um, a place for complaints um, with respect to hospice programs in the state um, or locality. So the state does have some um, leverage uh, when it comes to implementation because it's kind of a short timeline. But one thing that they don't really have um, lev um, le any latitude on is the investigative unit. So this hotline, it just can't be a hotline where people call and maybe somebody hears it and maybe somebody doesn't, but um, there has to be an investigative unit assigned to the calls that come in. So they're going to be uh, not only answered, but responded to, and when appropriate, um, there'll be an investigation launched on those. So um, it's important. So as we move forward, um, the state agencies can combine home health and hospice, or they may have separate hotlines for each one of them. So think about that um, and how all of that's going to play into um, the CMS um, national record keeping and complaint tracking. So um, those things that come in that need to be assigned a level of risk for the patients um, of the hospice organization, CMS is doing that now. And I think that um, what we're going to see, again, just like we're seeing throughout these new regulations, is that alignment, right? What happens at the federal level um, is going to be happening at the state level and the accrediting organizations are going to be um, included in most of the things. So, um, and while this is not um, specific to those accrediting organizations, I think it's important that we stop and visualize that alignment because as we do visualize the alignment, then we can really see, you know, how things, the bigger picture of how things are falling into place. So something that, um, something to think about. Um, also think about um, how those calls might be prioritized when they come in. So that's one thing that, um, you know, we have a certain time frame here in Texas, if, you know, if we have something um, that is, uh, needs to be reported immediately, we, we have to get that done quickly. And as we get that done quickly, the, the state res response should be equally as quickly. So um, these are going to um, prioritize the complaints that come in. So it won't be a first come first serve drive through thing. We're gonna be prioritizing the, um, the most significant complaints first as they go through. So as you're caring for your patients and preparing for this new um, requirement, I really, I can get on my soapbox about this and you guys are just lucky I don't have a long time, but I cannot stress the importance as organizational leaders that you are intimately involved with complaints 
that come into your office, right? Because those complaints turn into bigger complaints that now can be called into this hotline at the state level um, and at the federal level that, you know, can get out of hand really quickly. And I say that um, not lightheartedly, but more candidly, right? So we don't want, um, obviously, we want to respect the rights of our patients. We want to make sure that we're providing the highest quality of care. But, you know, if, you know, the son is there and he just is not happy um, that you're coming to see his dad at three o'clock instead of 2.30 and he continues to notify the office about that, then that is um, the kind of um, complaint that can turn into something bigger because, you know, then you know, there's a possibility that he's going to be unhappy with something else and then something else and then something else. So when leadership is really involved in, you know, the complaint uh, process and management at the organization, it can curb a lot of um, um, complaints that I said could get out of hand earlier, right? Kind of, you know, that that first request, it's like if you're at a restaurant and the rest and the waiter forgets to bring you, you know, your, your iced tea. So you're sitting there for a little while and you ask for the iced tea. So you're a little, you know, aggravated and then maybe they forget to take your order and then maybe they get your order wrong, right? So at a certain point, you're going to talk to the manager or maybe you're going to go online and file a complaint about this restaurant. That's the principle that I'm talking about here is that when you can kind of address those complaints at the very beginning uh, before they grow up to be really big, um, that's in your best in, been, that's in your best interest and, and the best interest of your organization. So you know think of through how you're handling complaints, what is a complaint? Um, are you keeping your complaint log? Are you looking at it every month in your Q QA meetings? Are you, you know, addressing things as they come up um, with individual patients? Or maybe you've got a systemic issue. Um, a lot of us are struggling with staffing, and I know that's tough, and that's going to lead to some complaints probably. So um, it's how you respond to them that makes all the difference in the world. So I probably should get off of that and move on to something else. So make sure that you are tuned in to um, your state or local agency's policies regarding this hotline, how they're going to handle it, because ultimately um, you're going to have to change your admission documents, right, to make sure that you are providing your patients with the correct information at the time of admission about their right to um, have a grievance or a complaint. So let's talk about our accrediting organizations for a minute. So um, regulatory changes for them. We've talked a little bit about it, but you know, training um, timelines, 2567 and care compare reporting. So, um, so training our friends at the ACHC, um, CHAP and the Joint Commission, they're all gonna have to go through the federal survey training and testing. So, that is going to um, happen sooner rather than later. Um, and that should be interesting to see how that informs changes in the survey process. So we know that, um, I, we talked about it a minute ago, how accrediting organizations have different ways that they lay things out and different ways that they report them, how they assess them. So really looking at them going through that federal training should be very interesting. Now. Um, the 2567, so accrediting organizations have never had to use the form 2567. Now they did have to turn in their survey reports to CMS for, um, you know, validation and, um, obviously certification and recertification of the hospice organizations, but they've never had to actually fill out that form 2567, the statement of deficiency. So um, how this changes is, is that they can use their own form, but at the end of the day, 
they have to turn it in, their, their statement of deficiencies, their survey findings, their site and visit results um, in a manner that um, allows their findings and the form 2567 to be, um, I guess, to be um, standardized. I think that that's important. So um, what, they're do what they've done in this uh, final rule is they do the accrediting organization, like I said, can continue to use their own form um, for whatever they want to do, but they have to submit the 2567 to CMS. So that's gonna be something very new for them. So um, not only are they going through the federal training, and having testing on that training, now um, they're gonna have to fill out the 2567. And the reason um, that's important is because um, these survey deficiencies, the 2567 um, reports are gonna be available for the public. So it makes sense that every hospice has the same report, right? So that's super important. So the accrediting organizations, they can keep their own form for the plan of correction, but it has to have the, um, it has to have the elements of a, of the CMS required plan of correction. So you think about what that looks like, um, you want to make from, in my mind, I always say, well, you know, you wanted to figure out what happened, who was affected, who possibly could have been affected, and what is your action to keep it from happening in the future. So that's from my long-term care regulatory days and the days of yawn when I uh, worked, um, worked in long-term care in an environment where there were enforcement remedies like hospices having imposed um, this year. So, you know, you learn to be overly stringent and to be really um, dig into the little things um, that make a big difference in the end. So um, I do want to, um, I do want to talk a little bit about care compare reporting. So a lot of that's changing, right? Um, the hospice quality reporting um, program is changing what they have. Um, on the um, hospice compare or care compare. And now we're going to have our, um, we're going to have our uh, statements of deficiencies posted out there for the world to see. So really think about um, your compliance program and think about how you leverage your software to keep up with your reports, your quality, and keep everything running smoothly um, because it's fixing to be out for all the world to see. Okay, here we go. Let's talk about these enforcement remedies. I know if you have worked in a, um, if you've worked in long-term care, um, especially long-term care, you know what enforcement remedies are and they're not pleasant. And I have every confidence that everyone on this call um, will not experience enforcement remedies in the near future. However, it's important that you know about it so that when uh, maybe you take a new position or maybe something changes at your organization and it looks like that there are some serious uh, survey deficiencies, you want to know what the enforcement remedies are going to be. So the first thing um, is how are, what, what are we thinking about? What are they, uh, the um, federal regulators thinking about when they're thinking about imposing these enforcement remedies. So how bad was the immediate jeopardy? So, you know, I mean, some immediate jeopardy can be, I've heard some things that just really don't make sense, um, that that can't be immediate jeopardy. And I've heard some things that, um, you know, are very concerning. And I think when we think about a couple of years ago, um, when those reports came out <clears throat> that shook our industry, some of the stories that they had in those uh, or examples that they had in those stories were absolutely immediate jeopardy, like the worst kind of immediate jeopardy ever in the history of the world. <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing, but when you think about um, 
the nature, the incidents, the manner, the degree, and the duration. That's how they're going to be evaluating um, the extent of the um, immediate jeopardy and any other um, deficiencies that they identify. So you wanna make sure that I would suggest that when you are <clears throat> keeping track of your incidents and your complaints, that you track your nature, incidents, manner, degree. Um, you know, how many people were affected? We talked about that. So who's affected now? Who could be affected? What we're gonna do to um, put something in place to ensure that it doesn't happen again? what we've done immediately for the people who are affected and what is the monitoring system that we're going to have um, in place to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And so that's where this really kind of plays into the nature, incidents, manner, degree, and duration. So um, they're gonna be looking at repeat deficiencies. And, um, you know, I think I always say, you know, if you get a plan of care deficiency, that can be really difficult to clear, right? Um, because there are so many pieces to the patient's plan, plan of care. So that's one of those things that can be really difficult to get out of. So, you know, they're going to be looking at, you know, are they coming in every three years? And every three years, um, you're getting a pretty significant deficiency for, you know, a patient care um, concern or, you know, your plan of care, your comprehensive assessment of the patient, um, your patient rights, those kind of things. Now, they're going to be looking at the compliance history for your location, right? If your location is part of a larger organization, they're going to be taking a look at the larger organization as well to see <clears throat> what kind of, um, is there a pattern there? You know, is there something at um, the corporate level that is lending itself to um, these deficiencies? So something that they're going to be looking at, which I also think is very interesting. So um, <clears throat> that system-wide failure, you know, is it there? Is it affecting the care of the patients? Um, you know, and how quickly is it going to take a surveyor to go um, raise the flag for an enterprise organization and have, you know, surveyors at every one of their offices in short order. So something that you want to think about, something you want to make sure that, you know, your policies and procedures reflect the care that you're providing, but also um, reflect the, um, the needs of your organization and the larger organization as they align with the um, goals and um, <clears throat> desires of the uh, board of directors. So what are the available remedies? What can we get in trouble for? Um, civil monetary penalties, those are super painful. Um, suspension of all or part of payments, temporary management, directed plan of correction and directed in-service training, or if it doesn't go really well, your termination of your provider agreement, right? <clears throat> so um, let's talk about civil, oops, let's talk about temporary management. Just kidding. Um, yeah. Let's talk about temporary management. So a temporary management situation um, is not good. So when you get to that temporary management situation, that means that, um, you know, you've got condition level deficiencies. So think about the conditions of participation, right? So we have our conditions of participation and then under that, so the condition level. So if you think about your plan of care, right? So inside your plan of care, you've got multiple little things inside of there, but your condition level deficiency would actually be for the plan of care, which means that you have failed entirely or most of, <laughs> that you have not done a good job of meeting that, that whole um, section of the conditions of participation, right? Um, these are going to be looking at um, management deficiencies. So um, 
is there a lack of leadership at the organization? You know, the temporary management, so the maximum time frame for temporary management is not to exceed six months, but the duration is determined by CMS, right? So one of the things in addition to the other issues that you may be facing if you're under temporary management is um, the responsibility for paying for that um, temporary manager, their salary, their expenses, um, and they, you know, it's not like they can, you can pay them less than what you would be paying for a regular um, leader, you're going to have to pay them the same. So um, your temporary manager can um, be internal or external to the organization. So, you know, if you're part of a large organization, that might be something that you can work out. You know, however, you know, if it's, um, if depending on the circumstance, you know, you may have to have um, an independent temporary manager come in. So something to think about, um, you know, they're going to be acting under the um, supervision of the, of the organization's governing body. So think about that. And, you know, they're going to have to have the qualifications to um, be a temporary manager, right? Can't be somebody off the street. It's going to have to be somebody with a lot of experience and knowledge. Um, the other thing is, is that um, they have to be um, approved um, or appointed by CMS or the um, state. So, you know, it's not, it's not easy. Um, ending the temporary management is going to be when things kind of fall back into compliance, but um, it can't be more than six months, but, you know, there needs to be an immediate plan to um, end your temporary management as soon as it starts. So let's talk about <clears throat> civil monetary penalties. Civil monetary penalties. Um, so these are penalties for um, significant um, deficiencies, right, <clears throat> and operations. So a civil monetary penalty per instance can be $1,000 to $10,000. Um, it can be per day, so $500 to $10,000 with a daily maximum of $10,000. So um, when we talk about Per instance, um, <clears throat> we're talking about a single event of noncompliance um, that's identified and corrected during a survey, right? Um, the per day is going to be something about um, that is ongoing. It's going to be um, <clears throat> at the IJ level um, for a statement of deficiencies. Um, <clears throat> so pretty significant. So it's important to know that, keep in mind that you have a daily maximum, but this is um, a civil monetary penalty per day at $10,000 a day, um, that can drain you pretty quickly. So what is CMS thinking about when they're thinking about their civil monetary penalty amounts? Like how do they determine what's gonna happen? So again, we kind of go back to the size of the, um, hospice organization and um, the size of the program and its resources, right? So um, they're gonna be looking for um, a strong QAPI program, right? That's gonna get you a long way. And, you know, again, I'm a big fan of the monthly QAPI meetings um, where you can really dig in and solve some problems. Um, in a short amount of time. And that's going to really help you here as well if you find yourself um, in a situation to where you might have civil monetary penalties um, imposed. So you want to make sure that that QAPI program um, and just your system in general is supportive of providing the right care. Make sure that... Um, the patient has is safe and avoids risk. You know, it's 
it's the basics, right? So we want to make sure the patients are well cared for, right? We want to make sure that, you know, if there's a complaint of any kind of harm that we handle that very quickly. Um, you just want to make sure these are all about patient health and safety. So that's what you're really thinking about. And so as you think about your hospice organizations, think about what guardrails you kind of have in place for the um, health and safety of your patients. So um, if you have um, a number of deficiencies that would require civil or reach the goal of civil, civil monetary penalties, um, they can, you can get dinged on multiple, right? So maybe you are on a per day thing and maybe they said, okay, well, $500 a day um, for a health related issue that's widespread affecting most of your patients. And by the way, um, we're going to give you another $500 a day for a safety issue that we found that seems to be widespread. Um, so then you're up to $1,000 a day. So they can do um, multiple um, deficiencies. They can't go over the $10,000 a day. Um, that's really important to, to remember as well. And when you're talking about the civil monetary penalties, you always have the right to appeal those. And it's really important that those appeals happen as quickly as possible. Um, you know, in the event that you're um, victorious and you win your appeal, that stops the, um, the money um, coming out of your uh, payments sooner rather than later. So thinking about um, the ranges, so a lower range, like I um, mentioned before, you know, $500, that's really kind of a slap on the hand. But as you go up and things get to be, you know, more severe, um, you get to that 1500 to 8500 range, and then the 8500 to the $10,000 range. Those are all important numbers um, to remember. And, you know, um, I think when they talked about survey history before, and when they're talking about um, resources and all of those things, I think that when there are continuing issues with the, um, with the hospice organization and, you know, the surveyors are coming in and they're finding the same thing over and over again, and it's not just something really minor, um, you know, it's something pretty major, you know, you're going to bump up to that upper range pretty quickly, right? So you want to make sure um, that you're familiar with what those ranges are for, specifically for your area, what you're seeing. Make sure that you go back um, before the first of the year and look at your survey history, right? If you're part of a larger organization, um, you know, there should be some activity around understanding, you know, what... Um, deficiencies other offices have had, right? So that you guys can work together to streamline that improvement of care. Okay, so if you get a civil monetary penalty, you're gonna get a letter saying that they're, they're thinking about it and they're planning on imposing it on you. So um, what happens is um, you get the proposed, you get the, you get the notice, you get the proposed effective date, um, and then you get a final notice that with the amount of the penalty that was assessed. So the to total number of days of non-compliance for per day for CMPs, the total amount due, the due date of the penalty, the rate of interest y'all to be charged on unpaid balances, um, once the hospice program has received a notice of intent to impose a CMP, it has just 60 days um, to uh, 60 days from the receipt of the written notice um, to either request the hearing that we talked about or tell CMS that we're going to waive our rights to an administrative hearing. Now, um, I think it's always important, you know, I go back to my long-term care days and, you know, um, I took over a facility that was a little bit in trouble. And so I got to learn about civil monetary penalties and boy, it's painful, but um, 
you when you get that letter, you know, when you have a survey that maybe didn't go so well, a lot of times the uh, surveyor will tell you that, hey, this is this is um, IJ. They have, you know, they hang around until you get it fixed or, you know, they know that you've gotten it fixed. Maybe it takes two or three days. You know, you can expect to get that letter. And when you get that letter, you need to let them know um, what your intention is to um to it to respond right are you gonna get an appeal going are you gonna just um waive your right to an administrative hearing they need to know what's going on so um in accordance with the procedures um that are proposed regarding waiving the admit the right to an administrative hearing the programmer will see the 30 Five percent reduction in the CMP amount. So, um, if you waive your right to the um, hearing, then you can get a a, um, a reduction in the amount that you're going to have to pay. So, think about um, that when you are thinking about your um, civil monetary penalty action plan. You know, what is that going to look like for your organization? Um, how are you going to have it? So um, I've got more information about how the civil monetary payments are going to be handled um, in my handout that you guys will be receiving. But I want to make sure that we get to suspension of payment. There's been lots of talks about suspension of payment. So um, people were very concerned about it. There was... Um, you know, a lot of questions, a lot of comments um, on this proposed final rule. It's important that if it goes far enough, you know, we've done everything that we possibly can to address the issues that are going on with our hospice organization, organization, and we still have problems, you know, we've got civil monetary penalties, we've got, you know, temporary manager, nothing seems to be working, they can stop payments to your Medicare payments to your organization. And the way that looks is they, they do it for new admissions. So um, payment for new admissions may start on December 1st, right? Um, and will go until you are um, significantly into in compliance, right? So the good, it, they can't exceed more than six months. Um, so you want to make sure that this, um, that if you get to this point that you're taking very swift action because, you know, CMS still does have the, the authority um, to terminate your contract. So thinking about um, how suspension of payments would affect your organization is something that I think is important when you're thinking about compliance. So um, something for you to think about kind of down the road as you put your um, workbook together. So, um, so you're ready for these new um, regulations. So let's take a look at directed in-service. This is one of the options as well. And kind of as we close down here, I want to talk about this. So directed in service, um, this is going to be um, where staff performance um, resulted in noncompliance. Um, and it was determined that training was the best thing to do, right? So the instructors of these in-services have to have an in-depth knowledge of the um, areas of specific training required, right? Um, and the training should be, um, with the, the goal of the training should be um, significant positive um, improvement in the issues where they're having the problem. So, right, so we get a deficiency A and it was not good, you know, it was pretty bad. We got deficiency B. It wasn't terrible, but A was pretty bad. So we may get directed in service for B. So we're gonna to have to contract with someone to come in and provide that training um, for our organization. They're gonna to have to be an expert in their field. Um, 
And I think that um, the way it's listed, I don't think that, the way it's listed is um, it could be schools of medicine or nursing, area health education centers, centers for aging. Um, so you want to make sure that um, you identify those places, you develop those relationships just in case. And don't forget, um, those services have to be paid for. So your directive plan of correction, um, you know, that's going to be a temporary manager situation. CMS is going to be involved. And what they want to see is um, outcomes to be achieved, those corrective actions, and by when. So what do we, you know, what do we want to achieve? What corrective actions are we going to take? And when are we going to have it done? So um, think about that. Um, it's important that you know what could be out there. I know that many of you have um, stellar compliance programs and have done very, very well um, and won't ever have to worry about these things. But I just, you know, I think it's important to talk. And I talked about the termination of the provider agreement earlier. So really, um, <clears throat> failure to correct those condition level deficiencies that we talked about um, in six months. Y'all, number two, failure to submit an acceptable plan of correction. That's, yeah, um, failure to relinquish control to a temporary manager. Um, failure to meet the eligibility requirements for payments. So think about that um, when you're thinking about what's out there um, and what could possibly um, affect your organization down the road. I have included for your reference um, some links to the things that we talked about here. And I want you to know, um, kind of as I wrap up here, I appreciate you uh, joining this webinar today. It's always fun to visit with um with you guys and to provide some ideas and thoughts of how you could, um, how you can be prepared for changes that are affecting our industry seems like on a daily basis. Um, if you have questions, please make sure that you include them in the chat like we spoke about before. We'll follow up with you via email. Um, we'll also send a link to everyone who registered um, to this presentation as well as the recording so that you can share this with your colleagues. We're so glad that you joined, the, you joined us today for this webinar and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.